Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the IIA in Dublin. Just allowing a few moments for people to find their seats as the Zoom room populates. I'm delighted to welcome you to this event, a keynote address from Professor Alberto, Alberto Alamano. Alberto is one of the most exciting thinkers of his generation across the breadth of public policy, taking in uh, law, health, society, and very much in between. And it's a real honor to, to host you, Alberto, here, uh, albeit virtually in Dublin. Uh, before um, hearing from the professor, it's my pleasure to uh, hand over to Catherine Meenan. Catherine Meenan is a, a consultant at EU Affairs uh, and an active member of the IIA community, including but not limited to chair of our own Germany German Affairs Group. Uh, Catherine, thanks for being available to moderate, and I hand you the floor. No, thanks, Barry. Uh, no, good afternoon to everybody, and thank you for coming to, for joining us. Uh, I must say we're delighted that Alberto can be with us this afternoon. We're really looking forward to hearing from him. He is, as Barry says, a really original and exciting thinker. Just on the details, he will speak to us for about 20 minutes, and then he we will go to Q&A with the audience. So um, one of the better aspects of doing it all online is that you're responsible for your own fire exits, but I would ask you to use the Q&A function uh, on Zoom, which I think everybody is fairly used to now. So please send in your questions as you think of them as it goes along with your name and affiliation, if appropriate. And we come to them once Professor Alamano has finished his presentation. The presentation and the Q&A are on the record. You can also join the discussion on X using the handle at IIEA. And please tag us in any posts. So Alberto Almano is the Jean Monnet Professor of European Law and Policy at HEC Paris. His research has been centered on how the law may be used to improve people's lives through the adoption of power shifting reforms, countering social health, economic and political disparities of access within society. He's the author of more than 60 scientific articles and a dozen books. He's permanent visiting professor at the University of Tokyo School of Public Policy College of Europe in Bruges, and a scholar at the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. He's a fellow at the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation at Rutgers University. He's the founder of the nonprofit organization and movement, The Good Lobby, committed to equalize access to power. So we look forward, with a, with a CV like that, we look forward with great interest to what you have to say to us, Alberto. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, um, Catherine, for giving me the floor to Barry and to the IA for the kind of invitation, for the opportunity to share a few thoughts um, ahead of the European elections, uh, which start uh, gearing up there, start capturing the imagination of the media and likely enough also of European citizens and, and voters. And that's the reason why the title of, of my presentation today is The Road uh, to the European Parliament 2024. But this is just the casus belli is an entry, is an excuse uh, to share a few words about the state of play of European democracy and what we can reasonably expect uh, from happening. Uh, the road to the European elections has been uh, incredibly punctuated by electoral moments this year. Uh, Europe really witnessed uh, an unprecedented electoral, reason, electoral season uh, with, with, with elections in, in a record high number of, of European countries. Uh, the, even the risk of having a rerun, Portugal is going to be <laughs> having elections in a couple of weeks from now. There might be a rerun of those elections in the same way as the Spain, as Spain uh, also risk having a rerun in in December. We had the Dutch elections that we didn't didn't lead to a government formation yet. <clears throat> we had elections in Poland that completely changed the political landscape by creating yet another challenge: how you redemocratize a country when uh, it basically eroded uh, uh, on, on the rule of law. So it's a, a terra incognita, is definitely an unprecedented season that is preceding uh, the electoral competition leading uh, to the June uh, elections in, in Europe. So it's no exaggeration that for the first time, these European elections really matter for us because we might be witnessing some structural transformation in which the political conversation are happening in, in Europe. So a few remarks on what to expect before, during and after elections. 
by asking a question I've been posing to different groups and communities across Europe of the past few years. And the question I have for you, which sounds a bit of a quiz, is what Europeans never do together. And, and when I, I ask these questions, I always hear that, you know, there are things we don't do because, you know, there's not really something that you can do at the education level. So our schools curricula look different. The taxation level, I don't have to say this, in Ireland are different. But in reality, the EU is also going there. What Europeans never do together for real is politics. So if you uh, stop and ponder about it, uh, what is going to happen on uh, June, in June uh, 2024, we'll be having around 400 million citizens across Europe being called to cast their ballot. And they're going to do this on, on different dates. Uh, they're going to be doing this uh, for national parties. So in Ireland, you will be voting national parties, uh, whereas in France, they're going to be voting their own French. In the polls, we'll do the same. We're going to be voting for national programs, basically ideas that have been concocted at the national level. And we're going to be asked to cast the ballot for candidates who share the very same nationality and citizenship they do have. So as you can see, this is so much for European politics. There's very little European. Everything is extremely domestic. European elections are nothing else but the sum of 27 parallel national competitions whose outcome has to be aggregated artificially ex post facto after the elections. And this explains why it's so difficult uh, to have a clear cut ideas on what it might happen in terms of new parliamentary majority in Europe. And that's why there's so much speculation happening today. After 70 years of socioeconomic integration, the EU still has no European party system. The European political parties are a loose federation of parties that have very little in common uh, one to another and which are not visible to the average European citizens. That means that uh, a national party today in Ireland or in any other country can still run for the European Parliament without telling their electorate, which is the European political group and European political family it belongs to. And I can give you plenty of examples. One which is very salient in the south of Europe is the Five Star Movement, uh, a party that has been around for 15 years. They never picked their European political family. So they are independent. Some of them join some groups, but there's very little ideological consistency in the way in which they vote and where they come from. When you vote for the European election, most of the national parties don't indicate their political party affiliation. So there's no link being made by the act of casting your ballot vote in the political color of the European Commission that might be emerging as a result of that vote. Here, there are some examples coming, for instance, from the Netherlands, I think is an interesting one, where the outgoing uh, Mark Rutte, uh, prime minister leader of the VVD, the Liberal family, previous government actually, uh, fell as a result of another Liberal Party member of the ALDE, the Liberal Party, because they disagree at the national level. So the party fell, the government fell at the national level, but nothing has changed at the European level. D66 and VVD, they belong to the very same European political party. And then I can ask how many people are fully aware that when we're voting for uh, um, for Angela Merkel and for CDU, and today they are working. They were voting. They would be working for. They would be voting for EPP. Uh, they would also be voting for somebody like you know Viktor Orban Fidesz when he was still part of of the party. So this limited intelligibility of the system prevents us from really understanding what is happening. Out. But there is another side of the coin. It's not only the absence of a pan-European electoral competition is also the absence of a European public sphere, meaning that what happens in Brussels is narrated in 27 different ways, uh, depending on the country in which you are in. So if we have a major speech by Ursula von der Leyen, well, that speech uh, will be narrated from the national angle, the national interest perspective of every single country. That means that Europe does not necessarily suffer from a democratic deficit, as many scholars have been trying to demonstrate over the years. I'm not one of them. But it rather suffer from an intelligibility deficit. At the end of the day, who is in Brussels represent us directly or indirectly has been democratically legitimated, right, through governments, through parliamentary process, through elections, through appointment processes, which are pretty democratic in nature. But the system is not readable. And that's what probably is holding us back today. How can we tackle 
pan-European challenges, if those pan-European challenges ranging from how to tackle migration all the way to how to address climate transformations are discussed according to the peculiarities and the political debates happening in a more parochial way at the national level. This is something we might call as democracy without politics. In a way, Europe has been depoliticizing itself uh, through its technocratic policy process and politics struggle to come in, even though a greater politicization is part of what we witness today, but not yet a Europeanization, as I've been trying to explain to you. Uh, the major consequence deriving from this lack of intelligibility is a lack of accountability. Who is responsible for climate inaction? Who is responsible for the pushback uh, against the climate uh, uh, package uh, that we witnessed over the past few months? Climate was the new raison d'etre. It was the real mission, uh, foundational mission of the Union under von der Leyen. But over the past few months, we have been seeing a reversal of that very same policy. Several parties, not only the EPP, uh, which was the first to be brave enough to say we no longer buy into this, but also the liberals, also some of the socialists, also other political families are actually taking or turning their back to the very same policy they subscribed to in 2019. Who is accountable for that? Well, difficult right now to make sure that we're gonna be able to identify the culprit and whether this culprit will be sanctioned at the ballot box because of the lack of intelligibility. Who is responsible for not ensuring the respect of the rule of law and having a commission uh, which could have been much braver in bringing more action against Hungary and in the past Poland in order to make them abide by the very same rules of the game they subscribe to when they join the European uh, Union. But in the meantime, and this is a very important point, I think, to be made today ahead of the European election, if politics uh, doesn't really exist at the transnational level because it remains a domestic national affair, the Europeanization of society, of the economy, has been going very fast. So if I ask you how many European citizens do live in a different country than the country in which they were born, well, that figure is 3.6%. So approximately 15, 16 million citizens. That might, some of you might say, well, is little, right? In the US, the interstate mobility is closer to 30%, so significantly higher. Well, they speak the same language. They've been together for uh, more than 200 years. So it's a different story. But there's another figure, which I think is much more significant. And the figure corresponds to the number of European citizens who are somehow exposed to another European country on a yearly basis. Because they have family, because they travel, they go on holiday, this figure is 50%. So one European out of two uh, is somehow exposed to the European project. But the problem is the other 50%, one out of two, is not exposed. Why? Because historically the Union has somehow put a specific premium uh, on those who actually benefit from free movement, the mobile people as opposed to the immobile one. And this is clearly one of the challenges today also uh, ahead of, this, of these elections. And this explains why over time, already 20 years ago, there's been an attempt at Europeanizing, so fixing this original sin by creating some different rules of the game. The first important rules of the game, 2009, has been to embrace a timid form of parliamentarization. That basically means that the choice of the president of the European Commission has to reflect uh, the parliamentary majority that is emerging from the ballot box. And this has been a game changer. Is something that is really giving the final word to the European Parliament, because if the European Parliament won't vote by a majority, the candidate president, designate president selected by the European Council, well, that president will never become a president and that commission will never see the light of the day. And ask Ursula von der Leyen when she only got eight votes of difference uh, to actually become a designated uh, president in uh, at the end of June uh, 2019. This explains why in 2014, uh, for the first time ever, uh, we had a system, so-called Spitzenkandidaten, that for the first time tried to do the following, trying to convey uh, to the average voter that when casting their ballot box, the choice, uh, uh, their choice would have been uh, defining the political color of the European Commission itself. And the rule at the time was that the party, the European political party, getting the highest number of votes 
would have automatically received the presidency of the count of the commission. Um, this was interesting to see. Mr. Juncker, as the lead candidate of the EPP, became president. However, when you fast forward, you see that in 2019, 2019 not all European political parties selected the Spitzenkandidaten. And it's not only the liberals, because Macron, at the time with renewal, realized that uh, it would have now, never been possible to uh, come on top uh, of citizens' preferences. And they start boycotting the Spitzenkandidaten process together with anti-European forces like Fidesz or Salvini League in Italy by simply not selecting as member of identity and democracy a Spitzenkandidaten. Uh, we therefore had already in 2019 a very uh, difficult situation to, to understand and unpack. Very few percentage points of the voters were uh, aware of the Spitzenkandidaten process. However, the turnout for the first time since 1979 went up. And the question is, are we going to be able in 2024 to maintain uh, that same level of turnout? Uh, big question mark. All the more so because in 2019, none of the lead candidates who have been selected by the European political parties made it as a president of the European Commission. Certainly not Manfred Weber, who was the Spitzenkandidat for the EPP. On paper, he should have been the one. Not Franz Timmermans, who was the lead of the Socialists, that came second and nor the Liberals, which came third. That means that uh, the pick uh, by the European leaders went uh, uh, to uh, Ursula von der Leyen, at the time Minister of Defense in Germany, not running for the European Parliament, not with a European political program, nothing, uh, just uh, falling from the sky and gaining control of the European Commission. So the question at the time was and remains, why should European citizens vote in 2024 if the political message they convey is not necessarily automatically translated in the political priorities and not even into the political leadership of, of the European institutions, but we simply witness an allocation of those posts uh, based on some calculus that political leaders make uh, in close uh, rules. Hence the attempt once more to change the rules of the game. So we spent three years in Brussels thinking, how can we modify the European electoral law in order to ensure citizens to somehow choose and define both the political leadership and priorities of the next European Commission? This was the promise of Ursula von der Leyen, first statement she made in 2019 when she made it through uh, the European Parliament vote. This won't happen again. Next time there will be new rules defining clear accountability between the casting the ballot box and the appointment of the political leaders. We are now four months away from the next European elections. The electoral reform hasn't been even considered by our member states. The parliament did his homework in trying to say, why don't we contest a number of seats, not only at the national level, but also in a pan-European college so that an Irish voter can actually vote for a German candidate a German candidate or a German citizen or Slovenian could actually vote for an Irish candidate who would be representing all European citizens, as the Treaty of Lisbon already say. MEPs represent all citizens, not only their constituencies. However, this idea was uh, boycotted by the member states, as well as other ideas like imposing the indication in the ballot box of the double logo, the logo of the European political party. So we are absolutely stuck, and it seems very unlikely that this European electoral law will have any chance to be ratified uh, before uh, the next European elections. If we fast forward, and I'm coming to uh, the very final part of my comments to you, we can imagine that when we're going to wake up as a result of these elections, that it's going to take several days. Why? Because the Dutch vote on Thursday. Uh, some vote on Saturday. Some European citizens, most of them, vote on Sunday. And the Italians keep voting on Monday morning to make sure the turnout is going to be uh, acceptable enough. But on that week, we're going to wake up and we're going to see a parliament that looks very different than today. There's a lot of speculation, but essentially what we can take for granted is that the incumbent established largest political parties, the European political party and the socialists and Democrats, are going to lose some seats. So we're going to be witnessing a sort of shrinking uh, of the incumbent party as well as the Liberals, uh, which represented a significant force in the current parliament, very much aligned in terms of voting behavior to the EPP and Socialists, and also the Greens, who have been 
uh, I would say, uh, a major political force in greening the political priorities of the Union are also set to lose big as a result of being sanctioned for their uh, political action in Germany, where they are in government. And Green's party are not everywhere in Europe, so they also suffer from that. But a major transformation will occur on the right side of the political spectrum, where we have been seeing uh, major uh, figures coming for the European Conservatives, led by Italian Prime Minister uh, Giorgia Meloni, uh, supported by PIS, the uh, outgoing uh, Polish um, uh, party that has been in government for a long time, Mr. Kaczynski, and also other political parties uh, uh, around them. Uh, uh, most likely, we're going to be seeing part of the far right in uh, France. We've been seeing with uh, Marion uh, Maréchal, who is the nephew of Marie Le Pen, joining ECR, and also uh, Mr. Uh, Orban bringing a significant number of elected, because Fidesz is going to score high, probably in that political party. And also a difficult but uh, cozy relationship between the, the conservatives and the ID, so the most extreme party, uh, Le Pen, uh, Mattia Salvini, and the AfD, which is set to score very high in, in Germany. So a lot uh, uh, of the political balance of the next European Parliament will depend on how the European New Conservatives, a party that was originally established by the British uh, when they left the European Popular Party a couple of decades ago, and the ID, which is a more recent European political party, Identity and Democracy, are going to be voting together. We see an attempt of the Conservatives, ECR, a la Meloni, to basically pitch themselves as the moderate right, uh, not anti-EU, uh, not questioning the very essence of the EU, uh, rather playing the game, and the other real right, uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, AfD, Salvini taking a much more colorful uh, anti-European stance, uh, notably alternative for Deutschland, even uh, mentioning the possibility of a German exit from the European Union, which seems very far-fetched, but this is possibly the only country in which you still have political forces gaining points by selling an idea which seems to be really expanding our overton window of what is possible. And then 60% of the new parliament being inhabited by incoming, newcoming, new babies. So new members of parliament uh, bringing a lot of freshness, but also inexperience, uh, which will probably also be a major uh, defining factor in the way in which this parliament will be looking at. So as a prediction, I expect greater politicization. The fact that Ursula von der Leyen has been endorsed by the APP as their, as their Spitzenkandidat, and the fact that she seemed to be the front runner we certainly politicize uh, the overall conversation. She has been into office for five years. She has been uh, trying to, <clears throat> I would say, water a lot of fireplaces uh, that were happening all over. She's been extremely reactive. She proved the EU to be resilient, but at the same time, she didn't get everything right. And uh, who is accountable to uh, if she's not even running for the European Parliament and she's going to be just coming out uh, of a, a closed door room uh, by European political leaders who basically say, Tina, there is no alternative in the absence of better candidate or more consensual candidate, we need to endorse her. That's where we are today. But this will lead in my view, and you already sense uh, that this is happening at de-Europeanization. So back in 2019, back in 2014, we've been seeing pan-European parties uh, like Volt, Diem, Parties that try to present one common political program, a common pool of candidates across the European Union. They were trying to push mainstream political parties to do the same, that were also running or allowing Italians running in France or having German candidates running uh, in, in Italy and, and vice versa. Well, I don't think we're going to see much of it because we are actually de-Europeanizing the political process at the very same time in which this is getting more political, more visible, more recognizable. The average European citizens now know uh, who is uh, Madame von der Leyen. What a paradox. What is the risk? And this is the very last slide. Well, the risk is a risk of paralysis. Paralysis of the entire European policy cycle. A commission inhabited for the first time by commissioner coming from rebellious party, let's imagine from Hungary, but perhaps also from Italy or perhaps from, let's imagine, 
uh, Portugal, uh, depending on how the elections are going to go, uh, will clearly represent a challenge for a college of commissioners that tend to vote tend to vote very little to act consensually, defining political priorities and acting autonomously from their political capitals. But if we have uh, one or two commissioners who are reporting back to their capitals on a weekly basis to represent the national interest, well, that's not what the commission is there for. The commission job is to identify the European interest, which is not the sum of the national interest, but is yet another thing. But this will inevitably reflect then on the European parliament, which would be uh, possibly still dominated uh, by mainstream political parties, but with a much weaker political support and with a variable majority on different files where the right, which might reach between the 25 and 30 percent of the entire parliament, will still be able to stop or delay or boycott the entire process. So this would lead to a slowdown of the political uh, the delivery of the political priority, a slowdown of the policy legislation of the reformist agenda of the European Union, thus somehow making everything more difficult to agree upon at a time of unprecedented challenges to the European project, at a time in which we face a very geopolitically shattered world, will the European Union be able to deliver on its own decision making in those political conditions? And for a taste of what has happened to us, just imagine that on July uh, the 1st, 2025, the presidency of the Council of the European Union, the Council of Ministers, will be taken over by Mr. Orban, uh, somebody who has been positioning himself as very pro-Russian, very close to the Kremlin, acting as a Trojan horse within the European Union, still defiant vis-a-vis -vis all the European leaders, and uh, really not pushing back, despite the major scandal that has been affecting his own party and some of his closest uh, advisors. So this is just a taste uh, of what is uh, waiting for us, Either there will be uh, a major wake up uh, by our European political leaders coming from the major political family, or there is a high risk of seeing the European political project being hijacked uh, by those, those forces that could be able to not only paralyze it and slow it down, but also change in the very nature of the objective and operation of, of the European Union. So I'm going to stop here. Hopefully I'm going to give you, I, I gave you enough uh, food for thought to uh, get your, your remarks, your questions, your reflections and comments and criticism, of course.